this is Mr. Philippeck, and today's little podcast is all about the scientific method, and basically an awesome way to approach thinking. And another thing here is that scientists use it to solve problems. And like I just said, we use a scientific method to solve problems, or sometimes simply to just answer a question. It could be a question that goes along with science, could be a question that goes along in our our own personal life, okay? The, the fact of the matter is we probably use it every single day without ever thinking about it. The first step of the scientific method is to identify a problem or a purpose. Before we do any sort of research, we have to find out things like, well, what do we want to know? What problem are we trying to solve? Like, why is the sky blue? We want to state our purpose as clearly as possible because without it, uh, a lot of times we'll, we may waste a lot of time on research. And then we have to answer the question, does our problem have more than one part? How many different problems or hypotheses might we have to address in order to solve our problem? Well, after we have identified our problem or our purpose, we need to begin this idea of observations, or what we call research. And we want to use our senses. So it could be our eyes, sometimes our ears, our sense of touch, Sometimes we may have to go research in a book. Uh, sometimes uh, we may have to, you know, log on a computer and Google, right? The idea is we want to gather as much information as possible. We also want to rely on any sort of past experience we have as any of our resources. And research is a, such an important step in gathering our information because we can use a lot and learn a lot from our past experiences and things that we need to use to solve our problem. And by using our past experiences, it will help us to form a hypothesis and a logical approach and an experiment to help us solve what we're trying to look for. So now after we've identified our problem, we have our observations, we've gathered our research, it's now time to form a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is nothing more than a prediction. What we think is going to happen. And we want to write these hypotheses using if-then statements. Like, if I do something, then I think something else will occur. Okay? It's basically a possible solution to the problem based on our observations, research, and past experience. It is also sometimes referred to as a testable explanation of what we see of what's going on. And so remember, the key to a good hypothesis is the fact that it is testable. We have to be able to test it. So now that we have uh, our hypothesis written, now it's the fun part of science, the experiment. All right? And a lot of times when students sign up for science class, this is what they want to be doing. They want to be doing experiments. They want to get their hands on the science. All right? So every experiment that we run, right, we have to test to see if our hypothesis is correct. And every experiment is going to have variables, constants, and controls, which we're going to go over next. The variable is what we're going to change in the experiment. And the variable that we change in the experiment is called the independent variable. And I kind of just abbreviated there. Independent variable. It is what the scientist controls. Then we have a series of constants. Things that all remain the same. And it's important that we have things constant because we really just want to test the one variable. If we have more than one variable that changes in an experiment, other scientists uh, can refute your findings to say, well, it wasn't because of the variable you were testing. It was because of some other thing. And remember, the control is our standard for comparison, meaning that we are going to gauge whether or not our hypothesis has been proven or not based on how our experimental group does against this control. And like I just said, during a very good controlled experiment, we are only going to change one variable at a time. All right? Because we must be able to compare and contrast this experimental group with the control. And as long as the groups are treated exactly the same, Except for the one variable, we have what we call a valid controlled experiment. So after we run our experiment, it is so important that we must analyze. And this is one of the steps that students often fail to do. 
They never asked the question was, was my hypothesis correct? Did my results make sense? If I need to refute or change my hypothesis, are there other experiments I need to do? If we've proven our hypothesis correct, then, if we, then we ask other scientists to recreate our experiment. And if they keep finding what we found, maybe one day we're lucky enough it becomes a theory. If the hypothesis was not correct, we have to then refute our hypothesis and then either come up with a new hypothesis or figure out ways to change our experiment so we can further test our problem. So now after we've analyzed our experiment, we need to form a conclusion. And this is where the scientist comes up with rather a summary. A summary of their findings. And that can include a simple restatement of the purpose. Our findings which are supported by data. You cannot just say, oh my hypothesis was correct because I say so. We have to use data and numbers, either quantitative or qualitative data, from our experiment. We have to answer the simple question of, was our hypothesis correct? If so, why? Or why wasn't it correct? And the other thing here is we have to identify sources of error, meaning beyond just human error. Was there other things or was our experiment flawed in its design? How could we improve the overall accuracy of our experiment? It takes many experiments over a long period of time to come up with a scientific theory, meaning that experiments are done time and time and time again. And if scientists can recreate your experiment and constantly come up with the same finding and they don't find any flaws in the design, you have the opportunity that maybe one day it becomes a theory. Now what we need to understand is there are very few theories, right? Like Einstein's theory of relativity is one. Right? The theory of evolution is one. These are concepts that have been proven time and time and time again, and it's quite different than, say, a theory that your friend has about why the bears may or may not be good. And over time, theories, if they're proven time and time and time again, can become a scientific law, and that laws will always tell us what will happen under a given set of conditions. But it doesn't always explain why it happens what they actually do is they just predict behavior. Well, I hope this little review on the scientific method helps you out. I hope you understand that sometimes we have to go back to the experimental stage, maybe redo our hypothesis. It's not just a one-stop shop. We're not always just going to start at the beginning and make our way to the end. Sometimes we have to go back at certain spots along the way to help solve our problems. Well, again, I hope you found this helpful. And as always, thanks for listening.